Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, what do you normally get if you take an Obama-appointed judge from Illinois and put a Second Amendment case in front of them? Hmm? Usually nothing good at all. But guess what happens if that Obama-appointed judge from Illinois actually follows the law? Well, when that happens good things occur. And we're going to talk about a huge, huge ruling today to come out of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Illinois. It has a lot to do with people who have lost their firearm rights and those who may be eligible to get them back. And it really, really shows the power of powerful Supreme Court precedent, especially when the lower courts are actually willing to follow it. Don't believe me? I'll show you here in just a moment. So let's talk about the Obama-appointed judge who just overturned a federal gun law. Okay, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about the case of United States v. Cherry. It is a case that was filed in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Illinois. It is a case that was argued before the Honorable Stacey M. Yandel, who was appointed by then-President Barack Obama. So, we have an Obama-appointed judge in the state of Illinois hearing a Second Amendment case. I know immediately all of you completely start crapping yourselves. I would too if I had been the plaintiff's counsel here. But here's what I got to say, and kudos to Judge Yandel. Because what Judge Yandel did, shockingly, is just follow the Bruin opinion. And one Judge Yandel, in fact, followed the Bruin opinion. Judge Yandel has come to the conclusion that 18 United States Code Section 922 G1 is unconstitutional. What is 18 United States Code Section 922 G1? Well, that is this federal statute which says that if you've been convicted of a crime in which you could have been punished by a year or more, in most cases a felony, you are precluded from possessing or owning firearms in the future. Judge Yandel, in the matter of United States v. Cherry, has found that the 18 U.S.C. 922 G1 lacks any type of a historical analog to support it and has, in fact, dismissed the indictments against Mr. Cherry. Mr. Cherry, obviously a convicted felon, was charged with two counts of being an unlawful felon in possession of a firearm. Judge Yandel and the court has actually dismissed that indictment. Now, like I say, from a political standpoint, it's highly likely that uh, Judge Yandel did not want to rule in favor of Mr. Cherry. However, to the honor's credit, this is how she framed what the issues and the inquiries for the court had to be. One, does section 922 G1 address a general societal problem that has persisted since the 18th century? Two, what does history tell us about disarming those convicted of crimes generally and of felonies in particular? Three, are there broader historical analogs to Section 922 G1 during the periods that Bruin emphasized, including but not limited to laws disarming dangerous groups other than felons? Four, if the district court's historical inquiry identifies analogous laws, do those laws supply enough of a historical tradition, as opposed to isolated incidents of regulation, to support Section 922 G1? If history supports a call for individualized assessment or for a distinction between violent and nonviolent felonies, how do we define a nonviolent or a non-dangerous felony? So, under the Bruin test, we go back and we say, well, does the text of the Second Amendment cover this activity? It deals with possessing and owning firearms, so it most certainly does. And now the burden shifts to the government for them to come up with some type of a historical analog doesn't need to be a historical identical twin, just a historical analog from the relevant time period that would demonstrate that we as a society have accepted these sorts of restrictions. Now, you can always tell exactly how good of an argument the government has by where they go with this. Now, they couldn't necessarily argue their favorite cop-out, which was standing, because obviously Mr. Cherry is the directly affected party here, so there was standing. But then you can always take a look at what sort of history is the United States government relying on. This is how the court put it. 
Noting that committing a felony results in the forfeiture of certain constitutional rights, including the right to vote, the right to hold office, and the right to serve on a federal jury, the government maintains that Section 922 G1 accords with the historical meaning of the Second Amendment. There is no dispute in this case that the straightforward historical inquiry does not apply as there were no laws categorically restricting individuals with felony convictions from possessing firearms at the time of the founding or the ratification of the Second or Fourteenth Amendments. The government argues, however, that the defendant's motion should be denied under the analogy inquiry because the Second Amendment's plain text does not presumptively protect the right of felons to possess firearms, and even if it did, Section 922G1 remains constitutional as applied to all felons because it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. And where the government comes down on making this argument is by trying to read into case law the same way we interpret statutes. And what they're going back to is they're going back to some language that was used in the Heller opinion that said law-abiding citizens, responsible citizens. And so then the government tries to label everybody who's a convicted felon, uses cannabis or anything like that as an irresponsible, unlawful individual, and therefore the Second Amendment, the text of the Second Amendment does not even protect those individuals. However, the court was quick to point out that, hey, listen, when we're interpreting case law, we're trying to just give the general meaning of the actual case itself. When we get into statutes, yeah, we can start dissecting hairs at that point and getting into each individual word, as the court put it. This court finds that the references cited by the governments are clearly dicta, which the court is not bound to follow. It is evidence that Cherry is included in the people covered by the Second Amendment and that his conduct is presumptively protected. And then, of course, you know, the government always comes up to like, well, yeah, but this is all distinctively modern, you know. And so the founding fathers could have never contemplated any of this, right? And this is how the court dealt with that. Under Bruin, when a distinctly modern regulation such as 922 G1 is at issue, the government must offer historical regulation that is relevantly similar. The court must then determine whether the profit historical analogs impose a comparable burden on the right of armed self-defense and whether that burden is comparably justified as the burden imposed by Section 922 G1. Now, we all know where the government has to go with this, because if you're going to try to go back to the formation of our country and start citing the gun laws, you're going to be citing the gun laws that were absolutely positively 110% based in racism. The only purpose we were disarming people back in the day was because we did not like the color of their skin, we did not like their religion, or we believed that they were not going to be loyal to the United States. The court dealt with it as follows. Here the government asserts that two types of laws are proper historical analogs for Section 922 G1. A, laws categorically disqualifying groups who were untrustworthy adherents to the law from possessing firearms, and B, laws authorizing capital punishment and estate forfeiture for felonies. The first category of laws cited by the government involves Catholics in England who were disarmed for refusing to renounce their faith, Native Americans and enslaved black people in colonial America who were disarmed for not being dependable adherents to the rule of law, and individuals who were disarmed for failing to take oaths of loyalty to the government during the Revolutionary War. For the second category, the government points to crimes that were punishable by death and forfeiture of a state in colonial America. And so, obviously, you can tell that the court is not convinced by the historical precedents offered by the government, and then ultimately ruled as follows. Laws reflecting the English tradition of categorically disarming religious, ethnic, and racial minorities are not relevantly similar and historically analogous to Section 922 G1. These laws, justified solely on discriminatory basis, would thankfully be prohibited today. As such, this court finds they cannot impose a comparably justified burden on the right of armed self-defense. And I want you to really focus on the last thing, because that is really, really good judicial interpretation by her honor, where she says that, listen, even though these laws may have had some of the same purposes, they are not imposing the same kind of burdens. And because they're not imposing the same kind of burdens, they don't qualify as historical analogs. So, in striking down... 18 United States Code Section 922 G1 as unconstitutional. Judge Yandel ruled, In sum, 
Defendant Cherry is included in the people protected by the Second Amendment because none of the historical laws offered by the government impose a comparable burden on the Second Amendment right of the convicted felon to keep and bear arms, and the court finds Section 922 G1 unconstitutional, facially and as applied. Now, this is a huge case. We're going to link it all up down below so that you can geek out on for the rulings yourself. Obviously, the United States government is going to crap his pants and appeal this case. We have to carefully watch this case as much as we have to also carefully watch United States v. Daniels, which is on petition to the United States Supreme Court, and Range v. Attorney General of the United States. As you recall, those two cases involve cannabis users and those convicted of nonviolent felonies. One of the big areas that there's been a significant soul-searching on post Bruin has been this whole disarmament regime and how many people should we be disarming and how many people should we start allowing to restore those rights. I think that we are really just at the tip of the iceberg of what's going to be an evolutionary process as it relates to a lot of the restrictions found in 18 United States Code Section 922. This is just one of what I believe will be many, many rulings and we will see contrary rulings and ultimately the Supreme Court is going to have to get involved in a lot of this. Listen, if you got any other questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is right down there in the description box. Now, in the meantime, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.